Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's so great to have you all with me on the Highway to Scale, a podcast in which we explore the ins and outs of business success and where we cover topics like validating business ideas, exploring different management styles, building products, launching them on the market, raising capital, and scaling your business. Now, before we get to the main part, please consider subscribing and get in touch with me if you want to be a guest on the show. In today's episode, I'm joined by James, who is the CEO of Cognizm, a company that redefines the way you conduct all of your prospecting and sales activities. In just a few short years, Cognizm turned from a fresh startup into a global powerhouse that raised more than $38 million in funding and grew to a couple hundred employees. And they are still going strong with their planned entry into the US market. In this podcast, James will tell us more about his mindset when it comes to raising outside capital and why is it important for a CEO to always hire people that are better than them. So let's cut the intro and let's jump right into the episode to see what James can teach us about building a business. James, it's so great to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you for having me, Dorian. So uh, let's start with the basics. Can you tell me a little bit more about Cognizm? What do you as a company do and what is your role as a CEO? Sure. So I, I'm a, Cognizm is in the sales intelligence space. So we really help our customers to find new business. Um, so we, we have a data asset which is, um, you know, uh, compliant B2B contacts, um, you know, uh, people where they work, what their job title is. And then that's, that data is blended in with um, firmographic data, with event data. So with our tool, you can say, okay, give me all of the um, heads of HR in um, North America whose companies mm -hmm. are looking for HR software, for instance, um, you know, would be one audience. You can build different audiences that are relevant for you and then you can outreach to them by email and by phone uh, to, to engage them uh, and, and to win new business. So, so we're really about um, helping people prospect, but we're now mm -hmm. also adding in new features to also just help other um, personas, for instance, like account executives, marketing, to 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 also um, generate new business and to, to help them close deals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what would you say, uh, what makes Cognizm better than some of your uh, competitors? Why would why would someone uh, choose Cognizm over someone else? What's that? What's that one thing? Yeah, I say that we're, we're, we're one a big a big aspect is compliance. Um, so mm -hmm. so we make sure that we um, gather data in a very compliant way. All of our data is notified. So when you outreach, you can feel very safe that you're not going to kind of breach any GDPR, um, yeah, CCPA yeah. Uh, regulations. That's that's one of our core strengths. A second core strength is just that we we have a big focus on Europe, yeah, European data. Um, so you know, we would say that we were best in class in terms of European data. Mm -hmm. And then uh, third, I would kind of say that, um, you know, just, just the innovation in the products, um, you know, what, what our team's doing, um, you know, I'd say that we're doing things that other people aren't doing. We have uh, features, uh, functions that, that other people do. And what, one of the things we're really well known for is our customer support and success. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of solutions um, at, at the low end of the market um, just don't have um, very good support. And, for yeah, sale, yeah. For especially for small companies, um, even for large companies, you know, getting a, a sales motion going is very difficult. Getting uh, you know a, a revenue function going and, and bringing in new business is difficult. It's not just about data; it's about workflows, and we're very good at mm -hmm. supporting and helping customers get going with our workflows. Yeah, basically, you're you know building a community that always comes back to you because of that uh, customer support. Uh, yeah, exactly. So in, in one of the interviews I, I read, uh, you said that sales is the biggest problem and something that a new CEO needs to tackle, you know, right, right from the start. Can you, can you tell me uh, what is your mindset about sales and uh, how did you build your sales team? Sure. I, I, I think, you know, um, one of the important lessons I've had is really about, you know, uh, how you build that go-to-market function. Um, based on the ACV of the product, so you know, it, like it's it's very very different. If you've got a good uh, like a higher ACV, like let's say over 10k uh, mm -hmm. ACV, then you, you know it's it's great. You you it's you're kind of in the right. Um, uh, I suppose like 
price to build a direct sales team. The mm -hmm. great thing about a direct sales team, so we have about 50% at the moment of our um, growth is from inbound and 50% is from outbound. Outbound scales with the number of people you've got. So the, the, yeah, know, yeah. it's great from that perspective. It's not just throwing money at Google ads and, you know, um, the, the, so, so having that, um, you know, being the, the problem then you have is hiring, right? It's hiring, it's having mm -hmm. a hiring process, it's being able to select good SDRs, it's having a training program, it's being able to, so it creates a different set of problems, but it gives you like really, if you've got a very big, large market like we do, a very large town, then it's really just about scaling that team to, to the maximum size to to see all the qualified ops that are gonna be placed on the market every month. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that but you can get that growth by just, hiring hiring that headcount when you get to like um pay like the inbound and using paid or you know creating content it's a different game right and mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. it's a game that's getting going to be get more, more difficult in the future um so the because you know cookies are going to go away um and yeah, yeah. um the the you know it's going to get more expensive to do inbound um uh. Yeah, so 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 you know the, 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 it's a lot more scalable, um, and outbound is going to be, I think, even more important in the future, just because it's going to get more difficult to target um, your relevant audience on the on the inbound side. Um, so so you know, I think that that's that's one aspect of you know having the right ACV, being able to build the direct sales team. And if you don't have the, the if you have a very, a very low ACV, then it's really about you know creating the right um, product led strategy. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, creating the right, uh, uh, yeah, a product like product led strategy, and then having the resources on the account management side to grow that yeah. that yeah. business that lands. So it's it's really about getting the go to market defined right, and then being able to um, uh, like designing it correctly, and then and then they can maximize your revenue, you can maximize your growth. Great, great. So uh, when it comes to the technology that you're using, I, I read that uh, Cognizant uses uh, AI and machine learning as uh, as a part uh, as a part of the as a part of the platform. So uh, what do you think? Uh, what do you think about you know using technologies like that to build successful companies? Is that something that is going to be a necessity? Uh, I, I think to differentiate, I think you know, soft um, building a software tool. Uh, is very easy these days, very low cost. So mm -hmm. there's going to be an awful, you can see it with the explosion of applications in the SaaS space. So yeah, yeah. there's there's two ways to really differentiate yourself in the SaaS space. One is data. So having unique data, uh, original content, um, a, net, a network to collect data is one big differentiator and a big valuation difference. And then the second um, thing is to use machine learning uh, to create innovation inside the application because it's expensive. Like you, you can buy some machine learning just off the shelf. Like you could mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. stick in a uh, IBM Watson API, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And a lot of people did that, um, you know, and called and, and said that they've got machine learning. But actually, to build an original mach um, a differentiated model that's actually going to create a feature difference that's going to uh, make that product better um, is. Uh, like a, a big undertaking, right? Like it, you know, it, it's taken mm -hmm, us mm -hmm. a couple of years to do to kick, to develop and to kick out a couple of the uh, machine learning projects that we've had. So those are the two ways to really distinguish yourself these days. I, I like you know, um, there's only so many um, you know um, <laughs> scheduling softwares that can be built. Uh, there's only <laughs> so many you know. Um, it's going to be very hard to distinguish yourselves on on those kind of commodity tools and things are going to become like commodities at very low prices or if if not free um for, for the for like you know just uh, the very basic um software um just yeah, yeah, for pure yeah. applications so yeah you need you need machine learning as one of those differentiators mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so uh let me ask you a question about uh you know uh raising funds uh cognizant has gone through a couple of funding rounds so can you tell me uh how your mindset changed going from round to round? Because I read that as soon as uh, one round of funding uh, finishes, you always start looking at the next one, at the next one. So can you tell me uh, how does it change, you know, from the pre-seed, series A, B, C? I mean, the, the market's quite hot right now. 
So, I, you know, from speaking to a couple of founders recently, um, it's kind of flipped where there's a lot of demand to invest in startups. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, like I think it, like for, from everything I've hear, hearing at the moment, um, you know, it's a relatively easy period. When I, when I was fundraising back in 2016, it was it was very difficult to get um, money um, to get funded. I mean, I imagine it's always like feels feels pretty difficult, but um, like valuations a bit higher now, etc. For for even pre seed um, mm -hmm, startups. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, when I was when I was raising, it was really like um, you know, uh, I didn't have a lot of choice. It was really like grind really hard. There's this great article by Elizabeth Yin. I think it's like a hundred ten one rule. So you you send out a hundred. Um, you know, you you prospect to 100 people for funds you get about 10 mm -hmm. people interested and only one invest something like that yeah it, so it just it just shows you the scale uh, of the amount of outreach that you need to do to get funding um right now speaking to a couple of founders like in the last uh, couple of weeks it it sounds from that it's quite a lot easier at the moment and that, that it is more like a you know a 10 5 uh, 10 uh, yeah like a, a 10 to 5 ratio or something mm -hmm. 10 out which is gets you five five people interested and then you can close a good two to three of those um so um but for, for us it was really um you know the the uh, very very difficult to raise at the pre-seed stage uh, a lot a lot then easier at the next round um, it's just been easier round to round um, mm -hmm. to, to now the as the company we, grows. Yeah, yeah, as the company grows and and, and it become and you become more stable and you have got more stable revenue, um, then um, you, you can you can find a lot more pools of money that are interested in just mm -hmm. investing in a healthy, fast growing company, um, especially at scaled one. Um, so, uh, I mean that that's been my experience. That the the I mean, there's lots of nuances to it um you have to be careful at the early stage about the type of investor you take on the mm -hmm. rights that they have because a, a a bad investor at an early stage can kind of kill future funding rounds and really hurt your growth yeah um you know i i really like in the early rounds angel investors because they don't really take control but they add a lot of mm -hmm. input value experience i mean if you're a first-time founder uh which you know i was for cognizant the, yeah, yeah, yeah. You really want to learn from people that have done the journey before you, and then like because there's just one. It's like a you know a, a startup's like a like a like a fragile child, right? One mm -hmm. bad accident and you're dead. Uh, <laughs> that's, like, that's probably not a great analogy, but yeah. like the the you know it's just very fragile. It's, it's you know one key mistake. Uh, you know, like one of our big competitors. Um, uh, made a mistake of uh, going to the US market too early and spending all of their Series A money there, and it really crippled them. So you know, mm -hmm. it, like, mm -hmm. and all my my advice my advisors um, said, don't do that, don't go into US too early, and I didn't. And then you know, but I was I, I, at that what point I was really super excited about the US market. It seems so huge, but you know what you don't yeah, realize yeah. is it's super competitive and it's very very expensive to hire salespeople. They're like far more expensive than the UK, for instance. So. Um, you know that that's something to do. Like, what? Well, well, then now we're tackling it. Now, now we're at the right mm -hmm. size to tackle the US market. So, it's it's great to get good advice and and experience people um, and just learn from. So, so you know, it's important to use the funding rounds to make sure that you 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 get the right investors and mm -hmm. uh, and the right investors at yeah. the right stage. So, uh, what do you think about bootstrapping? Because uh, I've talked to a lot of a uh, lot of CEOs who have this, the same story as you about you know your your company is your baby and you you need to make sure you don't make mistakes. So they you know go the the bootstrapping round because they really don't want to risk it. Yeah, um, I mean it's it's like I didn't have the money to bootstrap this company. It would be growing a lot slower. Um, I wouldn't have mm -hmm. learned as much from the advisors and investors that I've had. Um, you know, if I if I if I do another company, um, I would definitely bootstrap it a lot further along the line because I have the money to do it. Right. So yeah, so when you yeah. meet these like serial entrepreneurs that have done like bootstrap companies, like some of them, uh, quite a few of the ones I've met have had successful exits already, and then they bootstrap the next one because of course they got all the money and they've got all the experience and they don't need to learn anything. Um, so so it's like of course you would bootstrap it if you've already had a successful exit um i think those that people who are bootstrapping it um and and I, I, I kind of doing that that i mean that's it's fantastic to do it because you can own more of the company um for me i'm happy i did i am happy that i did it this way um and i'm at, mostly because of the the 
angel investors and the investors I've had have taught me a lot, right? I've learned a lot mm-hmm. about being a good CEO. I've learned a lot about how, how to hire. Uh, like I wouldn't have got that advice or had that exposure or met um, all the people I would have met and had all the adventures I've had if I hadn't funded the company this way. So I'm happy I did it because it's been, you know, it's, it's, it's not so much about the money, right? That you get the exit. Like I, I, you know, I always had enough, like, I'm not like somebody has a very expensive lifestyle or anything like that. Um, mm-hmm. It's more about the adventure and the people you meet. And like, it's just been yeah. incredible fun growing this company to the stage. So, you know, I wouldn't change anything at the moment about like how we've raised or, or how we've grown or anything, because it's just been a great um, adventure, to be honest, like getting mm-hmm. to this point. Yeah, but and and you also you you don't have a you know exit strategy. It's not your goal to you know just sell out. Your grow uh, your goal is to you know grow the company even bigger and bigger. Yeah, I'm, I mean, uh, uh, if I'm getting uh, it right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, right now, like it is it is a, a, a like a bit of a dream to IPO for me at the moment mm-hmm. and take the company to that point because you know, firstly, valuations right now are amazing at like there, but it's also a good market, right? Like it's great to get the company to that point and to get liquidity for your early investors stage investors i mean that that's the other thing now like now that i've got invested like investors um it's great to get them liquidity right like they invested they believed in me at an early stage um you know there's a lot of um there's a lot more um like uh bad stories for early stage investors, seed investors, like, you know, 90% mm-hmm, of mm-hmm. them, 90% of the startups, they typically lose money. It's great for them to have a success to kind of also fuel investment in other startups and just to create a better ecosystem. You know, in Europe, we are, you know, a couple of decades behind the US in terms of our startup ecosystem um, mm-hmm. and companies having successful exits, flushes money back into the system, gets, you yeah, know, entrepreneurs, yeah. gets, you know, experienced talent into the market again. Um, and that's really important for us to build, you know, uh, healthy economies across Europe um, that can compete um, with um, US, uh, US companies. So I think it's, um, that you know, that, that that's... That, that that that's you know like a good goal for me at the moment is to just um, a get liquidity for my early stage investors and um, mm-hmm. potentially a IPO uh, longer term. Okay, uh, so uh, what would you say that uh, what what makes the U.S. market so much better than uh, the European one? What makes it so advanced? I would I say it's in our space, and it's not for everything, mm-hmm. right? But in in our space, in terms of sales and marketing technology, there's a lot more companies. Um, U.S. companies are a lot more sophisticated with revenue operations and about how to do sales. Uh, they have a lot more tech than we do. Um, the, the, there's just a lot more expertise, um, like just talent, trained talent um, mm-hmm. as sales leaders, as marketing leaders, as people that, you know, um, managing CRM, adoption of CRM, all of that is a, like, you know, a couple of years ahead of UK. And I would argue that the, the, um, and the UK is even a couple of years ahead of, say, um, mainland Europe from what I've seen. Yeah, so, yeah. so th- th- there's, there's, which is, you know, um, also a big opportunity because, you know, what we see is it's easier to get business in Europe, um, to win business, um, or, or, you know, like there's less competition is the best way of saying mm-hmm. it, there's mm-hmm. more of an education issue. You've got to educate clients about why to adopt the technology, which actually yeah, gives yeah. you a kind of lower, actually gives you lower close rates, but a lot more ops, right? Like, and mm-hmm. so, mm-hmm. Yeah, we're really, you know, um, the pandemic has accelerated digitalization um, for sure, um, but there's a lot more to do globally, right? Like, the, 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 we're really, at, you know, uh, just getting going, really, on terms of the the, the adoption of cloud, new technologies um, in in so many spaces, in so many areas of business. Um, mm-hmm. You know, now now with the re- more of an agile workforce, remote working, um, so. So there's all these trends and they're, they're more developed in the US. Um, and now, you know, the, the, there's an acceleration of that globally. Um, and yeah, so the US market's great because there's, there's a lot more competition as well. So if you can compete in the US market and do well, you'll learn a lot, right? It's like, you know, if, if you're in a, um, well, yeah, well, look at it as if you're in a, you know, a, 
like a more brutal competition, you'll become a better sports mm-hmm. person. The same, same in the with the, but that could kill you, right? If you're too weak and you go into that competition, you could get killed, uh, which yeah, happens yeah. if you go in too young. But if you go in at the right size, then you know, competing and winning business mm-hmm. and getting all the feedback about why you lost and then putting pushing that back into the product will get you into um, a, a point where you, you you become a very fit company um, and you have a great product. And then, you, you know, if you've got sales channels in other countries, then that'll just accelerate all that. So so that that's how I look yeah. at it. Yeah. So uh, you just mentioned the, the pandemic and its, uh, its effect. So do you think that uh, this entire process of, you know, embracing digital, will continue once the pandemic is done. Yeah, for sure. I think like um there's a couple of things that's changed like the sets of workers in the company that they, they've now realized they don't have to go into the office anymore. Uh, and the company's realized that they don't need those people in the office anymore. That actually mm-hmm. everything just works the same if not more efficient if those people or certain functions are just done at home, right? Um and people have better happier lives if they are at home and they're not traveling an hour into you know, a central city in an hour back and having, you know, all of the misery of missed trains and all that kind of stuff, or, you <laughs> yeah. know, get, catching colds and everything from other people, all, all, all that kind of stuff, right? Which, you know, um, there's certain, there's a, there's a lack of, uh, you know, um, uh, for, for, you know, I, I just did an offsite in Boston last, mm-hmm. uh, about a week ago and it was just great to just spend two days in a, in a, a conference room brainstorming with the team. You can't do that on zoom, right? We have these, you know, yeah, of course. I don't know, like, well, you're like, but my calendar right now is like full throughout the day of like meetings. I have to really work hard to get, get spaces in my diary. Um, you know, we've now created a meeting free day on a Friday, um, mm-hmm. so that we, we can have, you know, uh, headspace to think a bit, but it's not yeah, the same yeah. brainstorming with a team on Zoom versus brainstorming in a conference room. You get yeah, of course. way more better ideas and stuff. So, I, I I think right now, and you know, time will tell that we'll end up with um, part of the workforce in an office, particularly like SDRs, outbound teams, just perform mm-hmm. better in mm-hmm. office working together. Um, uh, the, the you know sets of workers that want to be at home and rarely come into the office but might come in for some social occasions and just to, to, to that and then more offsites so companies doing more offsites um, where they do planning brainstorming um, that type of thing and just more regular offsites um, especially if you as you've got more of a remote team and you're saving on office mm-hmm, costs mm-hmm. then it's way more fun just to meet up and do offsites together and have a good time um, and then brainstorm and just you know build the network that we you yeah, usually yeah. kind of get in the office so i think that's the future and it, and it to be honest to me it sounds more fun than 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 going into the office <laughs> nine to five um you know uh, yeah that is true that is true <laughs> so uh, uh another thing i i, I want to talk you, to you about uh, is about your mindset because uh, i read that you uh, say that you're a large workaholic that you used to work you know uh, long hours, weekends. Uh, so can you tell me a little bit more about it? Because uh, as you said, this company is your baby. So you you want to give it, you know, the most of yourself. But uh, how does it clash with your work-life balance? Yeah, so um, I would say that, um, I, I mean, I have a really good family life. So, you know, I've got, uh, you know, uh, wife, three kids, all very happy, um, live in Zurich. Switzerland, it's been you know, a very wonderful place to live. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, I have a happy home life. I mean, I mean, that maybe helps with the job. My wife also uh, works in a full time job. Um, you know, she, she's got a really good senior role at a, a large pharmaceutical company. Um, mm-hmm. And she mm-hmm. used to travel a lot. So she's very understanding if I travel, she, she's very understanding on the business. So, I suppose having a spouse that it was also somebody who um, has a strong work ethic, um, um, helps, um, that, um, I, I say like, you know, for me, um, you, you have to work hard at an early stage business. You have to put lots of hours in to stop it failing because it's just very fragile and it would fail. Now that the company's growing and I've got a, like a, the money and I can afford a good senior team, um, mm-hmm. you can, you can start to build more of a balance in. Um, so that's the light at the end of the tunnel. If you're running a company, yeah, you feel yeah. 
um, stretch. If it, when you get to a certain successful point, you start to do the hires. Those hires at the senior team just to be taking pressure off you so you have more time. You can do more of the strategic work and less of the operational work. So that's definitely where Cognizant's, you know, moved towards. And I've seen it. I've, you know, I spoke to a couple of CEOs at very successful companies and they say, actually, they've got to the point where their senior team's so good that they, they're they bored and they don't really know what they do, they should do, right? <laughs> because they got so much time. I, would, I haven't quite got there yet. I'd love to get there. Um, but, that, you know, that's the ultimate goal, right? Um, I, I just don't think there's a bullet you can dodge. You know, I, I'm helping mm-hmm. out um, early stage founders like quite a lot now at the moment investing also in, in, in um, early stage startups and it just makes me makes, makes me realize when I speak to somebody who's just you know a year in two years in three years in and the company how hard it is how hard it was yeah, right I yeah. go back to how difficult at that point is how fragile it is how uncertain you know you're not you're, you're finding lots of customers they don't they don't care they don't like about you've got mm-hmm. no case mm-hmm. studies you've got no references um so the the yeah, I mean, it, you just have to put the work in to make it successful at the early stages. There's, there's nothing you can do about that. Uh, if you don't, it just you, you, it won't grow. Um, and then you know you'll get you know as, as things pick up, you will it will get more successful. I think that's that's unfortunately a bit bit, bit of the truth. I mean, if people can get more of a balance uh, and still let it grow, I mean, maybe it's just a time thing. It just takes more time if you don't. If you put, if, if you don't have the time to really put into it, or if you want more of a balance, um, or it becomes more of a lifestyle business, right, rather than than mm-hmm. like having hundreds of employees. Yeah, yeah. Which is so, fine too. Uh, it's what you want in your life, mm-hmm. right? I mean, right now, I'm very, I'm very happy that um, the company's grown to the size it has. That I've had the journey that I've had. You know, my family's still happy, um, and, and I, you know, it's a, yeah. And so, so. Uh, like for me, I've I've got the right balance, and I'm I'm where I want to be. But that might not be true for nice. other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, can you tell me, was it hard to let go uh, some of those operational things that when you know you got a new hire, new senior hire, you had to delegate a part of the job because, as you said, cognizant is your baby. You always want to uh, you know give it the most. How hard was it was it to you know? give a part of your job to someone to someone else who should be now focused on that it's getting a lot easier because now i can afford the talent that mm-hmm. um is usually better than me uh, they're like the lot the, 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 the functions so so when yeah, you when yeah. you when you know somebody's better than you and you're like okay this person's just brilliant right and i'm going to hand that over to them um then um, like it's not a concern you know they're going to probably do a better job than you could do on on certain functions mm-hmm. right so um so, so that's good i, I suppose when you when you <laughs> when you're a very early stage company and you hire people usually um you know you, you're generally hiring junior more inexperienced people than you um and then yeah yeah, it, yeah it's kind of scary to hand over some stuff to them um so either the person's super sharp and i was i think very lucky that um, a lot of the people that i hired early stage were really sharp people that, that they picked up stuff that was brand new to them as well and then they kind of carried it and they did really well with it and you know i, I did also do have some bad hires and then you hand stuff over to them and it ends in disaster um but um you know the the you know uh, that's that's part of you know um hire slow fire fast type thing mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. That, that whole thing or hiring twos so that you've got two people in it you know if you can hire like if you can afford it you know especially in sales right like your first couple of sales cs hires you should be hiring in twos if one person um you know doesn't really work out then you've got like an, an option too yeah, you're not starting from scratch yeah so um yeah i mean you but you have to because you're not going to scale if you get you know the if you're keeping knowledge to yourself, if you're keeping um, operational process to yourself, then it mm-hmm. really slows down the scalability of the company. Yeah, because you can't do everything. Yeah, I mean, CEO's CEO's main job. I think I actually got this off uh, when I went to was when I was playing for Seed Camp, which I'd, I'd uh, recommend um, to be to to even to apply to these programs right you know, like stage just to to learn from the processes, even if you don't get in. Um, it, uh, you know, the, 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 they said on there um, that the function of the CEO is to hire, um, to hire people and to fundraise, and that's it. Um, mm-hmm. that, that was the main thing. Um, I mean, now, yeah, I mean, that's generally where I spent most of my time is hiring and, and fundraising. Um, and now, 
Um, you know, now the company's got to the size and I've got the team to the point where I can now focus more and more on the strategic stuff, key partnerships, key relationships. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that, you know, that's, that's, but, but like initially, you know, from pre-seed to series B, it was fundraising and hiring work where a lot of my time went. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what were some of the biggest challenges that, uh, you and Cognizant passed, uh, during this couple of couple of years, uh, the biggest initial ones were, you know, I mean, the first two years are incredibly difficult, right? You, you know, we started off as a fintech trying to sell mm -hmm. um, data to hedge funds, uh, like a completely different uh, thing, and that, that completely yeah, failed. Yeah. Um, you don't; it's knowing what you don't know, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and then getting people to give you that knowledge, like mentors, more experienced people. Um, you know, there were moments where we, I, you know, we were close to giving up. Um, so I like, I recommend this, uh, Paul Graham, the founder of Y Combinator has a great essay, how not to die, um, <laughs> which I recommend, which I, you know, read like, uh, once a week, um, <laughs> that they're, they're all at least once a month. Um, there's really about not giving up and then you'll eventually be successful, which was mm -hmm. so true for us. Right. Um, you know, if you have to pivot, but just don't, you know, got to the point where I ran out of money, um, had to take a contracting job. Um, and then just, um, you know, eventually kept on applying for funding and then had my lucky break and then have built the company up to where we are now. So the, so yeah, so, so the, the, it's really about not giving up in the early stages and getting advice. And if you are stuck and things feel like you're stuck, just reaching out to people who, who are ahead of you, who've been successful and asking them for advice. And then mm -hmm. it, it's one piece of advice that can change everything the next day, like your routine, what you do, like how you pitch the products, you know, um, just the direction you're going in, they can all be shifted, right? It's just your mindset, mm -hmm. it's your mentality. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. Are you staying positive? or not um you know um and then if you are if you have walked into a brick wall and you, you feel like you're not going anywhere just um yeah changing direction um you mm. know like that that's what happened to us um but like just keep going and you can you can be successful right like that's that's kind of the world we're in at the moment um you know there's tons of opportunity um there's you know you can look at the u.s market and see what's successful and then take that and copy it globally um, and be successful. There's, yeah, there's lots yeah, of yeah. different paths to take to, to success. It's just, mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. just not getting stuck and not being negative. So uh, what's that one piece of advice that, that you'd give, you know, uh, young business owners who are just looking to launch their product or they're in the process of just building it. What would be that one core thing? Uh, like, really deep dive your go-to-market strategy so mm -hmm. you know I'm, I'm always open to if somebody wants to outreach to me and then discuss with me i'm happy to talk to somebody about that uh yeah i think like that's the most important thing like really understand go to market like it, like the the go-to-market needs to match the acv of the product yeah, um yeah, yeah. you know the, it, it's not it's not trivial it's a complex thing you can't just look at competitors pricing and copy uh, you have to really think about it um you know that the, there are similar businesses um it, it's something i'm learning all the time about like how to do that better and better mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. so but but i think the getting your go-to-market strategy right is so critical to success if you get it wrong then then you know that can really cripple you um like it, it's more important even than to a degree, well, you need a functional product, but like it, like the the go to market and like how to do sales and getting sales, you know, if the product is not that great, then um, you can always um, you can you can you if you've got sales and you've got new business coming in, you can always keep on improving the product. Mm -hmm. But if you can't true, get if you have, you've got a great product and no sales, then you're going to run out of money. Event, uh, you know, uh, and yeah, then you exactly. can die that way. Exactly. So if you look at like the big companies like like Salesforce, right? Salesforce had um, even when they IPO'd, right? They they had incredible churn, um, and mm -hmm, then they got mm -hmm. churn right afterwards. But they grew their their sales team, and it's a similar story with other successful companies like HubSpot. Um, you know, if you if you read articles about early uh, HubSpot early, um, it did. It, you know, it, it's actually direct sales team was um, was great, and then they the, the product caught up with the sales. Like yeah, of course. So, so you know you need like the the the, the biggest 
you know, some of the most successful companies that what they've got right first is sales and then they got product right second. Yeah. After that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, we're almost out of time. So I have just one more question for you. Uh, what's next for Cognizant? What are your next steps? What can we expect? We've just we just launched a Germany team uh, team in Germany that's going great. Um, uh, I, I, you know, if, if that keeps going really well, then we'll, then you know we'll accelerate uh, plans to to launch a, a team in France, uh, which I'm very excited about because because uh, one of my best friends is in uh, Paris, um, <laughs> so it'd be great to have an excuse to go and visit him a bit more. Um, <laughs> Uh, we just we just um, you know hired a new global head of sales in um, in Boston in in the US. Mm-hmm. Um, so so you know just organically scaling in the in the US market, which is an incredibly huge market. Um, yeah, so yeah. so it, it, it's great to do that, but to do that carefully because it's you know it is a competitive, super competitive market. Um, you know just it, it's very exciting the, the space we're in, and then the global opportunity. Um, you know, for me on the tech side, it, it's great. Um, we've got a great um, uh, head, head of data science, uh, James Hodgson, who has a lot of skills in languages. Um, you know, us applying that globally is very exciting. Um, so just to keep growing and scaling, um, we've got, you know, we, we've got um, now a great distributed team. You know, we just we just started off in South Africa um, mm-hmm. hiring mm-hmm. people. That's gone fantastically. Um, and it's great to be able to like hire in 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 other countries and and create jobs in other countries. Um, so yeah, I'm just really excited to, in general about the future and and um, all the elements of the company. You know, both both the staff, the technology, mm-hmm. um, the and then the global opportunity. And it's it's really about you know me as a CEO uh, managing that with the resources I have so that we grow, grow organically in a safe way. Um, and and don't have an explosion of costs things like that. So you know, mm-hmm. it's just every day is a different challenge. There's new issues. There's new things to tackle. Um, in that 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 makes the it, it a very exciting job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So thanks, James, for all the great insights, and thank you for being a part of this podcast. Thank you for having me on the show. And we are done. If you stuck with us until the end, here are a few key takeaways from this episode that I want you to remember. Number one, as a CEO, always look to hire people who are smarter and better than you. This will enable you to delegate a lot of operational tasks and really focus on the strategic aspects of running a business. Number two, if you're looking to raise outside capital as a young company, be careful about who you take on as an investor. Look for someone you can learn from and who can help you grow. And number three, focus on designing your company's go-to-market strategy. If you do it correctly, it will enable you to maximize your revenue and your growth. Now, before you sign off, don't forget to subscribe so you get notified when we publish new episodes. And leave us a review if you enjoyed this podcast and learned something new. It will be highly appreciated. Also, if you want to be a guest on the show, shoot me an email or hit me up on LinkedIn. My contact info is down in the description. And that's it. I'm Dorian. You've been listening to Highway to Scale, and I'll see you all in the next episode.